Hello, hello. This is Kim Addis from Frame of Mind Coaching, and you have just joined us at the Frame of Mind Coaching Podcast. Today, I am absolutely delighted to introduce my guest, my co-host, Joan Sotkin, and she is the president and founder of an organization, a company called Prosperity Place. Joan, welcome. Hi, it's great to be here. So very, very quickly, Prosperity Place focuses on helping people. You're a coach, right? You help people deal with money issues. Money issues, which are never about money. <laughs> what are so, they really about? It's really about the, uh, the emotions that you're acting out through your money and creating your life stories. So when people say, I need more money, what they're really saying is I need more people because money comes from people. It doesn't just fly in the window. So when people focus on this, oh, I need more money. Why can't I make more money? Uh, I haven't reached my income potential. What I do is when they tell me what their problem is, I say, well, what are you feeling? And, and what have you felt, when have you felt this before? Because most people have habitual feelings that they act out through their life stories. And by understanding the habitual feelings, which start in early childhood, then you can understand why you need what you've got. You know, people will say, well, why do I need this? You need it to, to get to know yourself and to express the unexpressed emotions that you're walking around with. Okay, so I want to know a whole lot more here. So let's say I'm a person who feels like, man, you know, there are so many things I want to purchase, but I just can't afford it. Like I'm chronically behind. I'm, you know, late in my bills. Like I'm just always feeling like I am um, drowning financially. I can't get ahead. And it's been like that my whole life. Okay. So um, you're, you're in a difficult place, but not an uncommon place. And I don't look at that. I say, well, what are you feeling? So the obvious feelings would be trapped, uh, ashamed. The five main feelings that people act out through their money are aloneness, shame, anger, uh, deprived, and a sense of being trapped. And you're saying all of those. Right. So, so let's say those are the feelings, then what happens? What do you okay, do with the person Okay, so, like this? so people have to want to deal with the feelings, you know? I mean, people who come to me are, are not people who say, well, I don't care about the feelings. I have brothers who don't care about the feelings because we never learned how to feel as children. Right. And uh, once I discovered that it's okay to feel, I mean, one of the rules in our house was Sotkins don't feel. Right. And it's not a great place to start from. And no. once I, I went to Codependence Anonymous and everybody clapped when I told them how I was feeling, I right. said, oh, I need to figure out this feeling thing. Right. And I think that when you understand your feelings, it expands your world and keeps you from being in that tight space. Because when you're holding in your feelings, you're holding in yourself because your feelings are what you use in a lot of ways to interact with the world. You know, you do something, I have a feeling. Um, it's, it's where, and it's the present, it's where we are in the moment. I know you look at beliefs and thoughts, but to me, the feelings are right there. You know, and when you can learn how to feel your feelings, then you can move forward in a different way. Okay, so let's just, continue on this path. I presented you this person who, you know, feels like all those five things you described, right? Shame, trapped, um, frustrated, whatever those feelings are related to always feeling like they never have enough money. So okay. So longing, you... longing yeah. is one of their major feelings. Okay. So the problem isn't the money. The problem is the longing because when you have a feeling that has been with you all of your life. Yeah. So much so that you don't even recognize that feeling because it's so much a part of your identity. Right. And, and changing that, that feeling, which you can learn to do, is a threat to your identity. 
So, which is one of the reasons why people resist going from lack to enough, because if they are not habituated to enough, they have to go through the whole brain process of establishing this, this new habit. So first of all, when I work with people, I find out what their mother did, what their father did, how many siblings they had, where, were they in, where they were in the birth order. That's all the background I need. And that gives me an idea. Because if someone comes from a poor family with 11 children, well, they're going to always be in a state of longing and not mm -hmm. getting their needs met mm -hmm. and feeling deprived. I mean, <laughs> these are natural feelings to right. have. And people tend to think that they're not making more money because there's something wrong with them that needs fixing. Right. Uh, what's blocking me from doing this? Right. Well, what's blocking you, there's, it's, it's not that there's something wrong with you. You just have habits that you're using to create your life stories. And once you can recognize the habits, you can decide if you want to change those habits and using brain science, you can do that. Okay, so go back to longing. Because like, I'm okay. really, really fascinated. I know a couple of people in this situation. Yeah. And I, like, to be honest, I lack relatability. Like, I don't really understand those feelings, right? Like, I, uh, I, okay, I and I, I do because I was there. Okay, so this person has longing as you describe it. How do you address that? How do you change a person's feeling of longing? Right. I don't move them okay. from I don't change it. to yeah. feeling okay. Well, first of all, they have to understand that it doesn't happen overnight. And it's a process. Because if you've had that longing, I have a client who's a, the one of the younger ones of four and the mother had, uh, they had four babies, each one a year apart. Well, you know, he didn't get his needs met. Right. So he's always longing for more money. Okay, so we've worked over the last few months helping him understand that every time he says, I need more money, I say, no, 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 I, I don't. I, I want to know what the other sentence is. And as he begins to understand that the feeling of longing comes from not getting his needs met, it gives him a different way of looking at it. Okay, first of all. But the feeling doesn't happen in your head. The feeling happens in your body. Now, most people don't have a feeling vocabulary. So I'll say to someone, okay, when have you felt this before? What are you feeling? And when have you felt it before? But when I say, what are you feeling? I just ask, are you feeling contracted or expanded? Okay, so they'll say, I feel contracted. And I'll say, where in your body are you feeling that? Mm -hmm. and, and they'll say, in my chest or in, in the back of my shoulders. So I'll say, put your hand over that feeling and make the sound of the feeling. Now, most people start out with, eh, eh. So I try to help them along until they can get to ah, something because feelings by their nature have to be expressed. And if you don't express them, they get stuck in these receptors in your cells, mm -hmm. of the, in the cells of your organs. That's why you feel it in your gut or your heart. And, and it's this feeling of contraction. And when you make the sound of the feeling, that's expressing the feeling and releasing it from these receptors in your cells. So in that case, you're, the moment you express it, you're saying, I'm not contracting anymore, I'm expanding. Not, no, not necessarily. No. First, okay. you're, you're, first, you're releasing, you know, there's a couple, it's not like there's one technique that you use for the whole okay. thing. Okay, okay, so making the sound of the feeling is expressing it and learning not to be afraid of the sound of your feelings. Okay. As I said, most people start out with little tiny sounds. I have a, a, I'm working with a woman who is severely, severely abused. And there's no way she could have made a loud sound. So I'm teaching her how to whimper. Just to, uh, uh, just to get some sound out. Right. And it, it depends upon where the person is. 
And then I also teach them to recognize the contraction and to begin to feel expanded. And, and so we're, we don't have to have words. We don't have to use our head to do this. It's all happening within your physical system. Your body. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a so, whole system that goes with your mind and the whole thing. Okay. Well, <laughs> like I'm really, truly fascinated. So, so t take me one step further. Uh, so you help me express it. I feel it in my body. I figure out how to expand. But like a moment ago, you said, well, a person's need for money is really a person's need for people. Okay. So then we start saying, okay, now what do you have to do? You know, in other words, you also want to change your, be recognize your behaviors right. that, that are the result of how you're using your feelings along with your beliefs and thoughts. I don't right. think anything exists by itself. Right. Um, so that you recognize how your decisions are made. Uh -huh. In other words, when I decide to, to do certain things, the, the, every decision has an emotional component. Every decision has a belief. Every right. decision has a thought. And when you can recognize what goes into your decisions, then you can make different decisions. So are you saying, and I'm just really trying to sift through this because I find it very, very interesting. Okay. Are you saying that if a person is struggling with money, that the, the seed or the, the, the foundation of that problem comes from the way they feel, right? Yes. Their history and the way they feel. Yes. And the way they feel causes them to make decisions that don't enable them to change their money situation. Uh, that, uh, and helping them understand what they're feeling will helping them understand why they need the situation they're in. Oh. They need the situation they're in in order to express the feeling. And if they keep burying the feeling, they're going to do the same thing over and over again. Okay. So it, when I coach people, and it's not necessarily money related, but anything related, we find that people tend to embrace certain behaviors or situations that are clearly not healthy for them because in some way it serves them. And that's fundamentally what you're saying is that these feelings or the need to express the feeling is serving them somehow. Absolutely. And there, with the behaviors, there's another element that I'm really diving into now Okay. which is behavioral genetics. Okay. You can actually inherit certain uh, behaviors yeah. from your parents, from your ancestors. I mean, it go, it's so much more complicated than right. people want it to be. Right. <laughs> you know? so, so this could also apply to, let's say, weight loss. Oh, it absolutely. It could apply to relationships. Absolutely. And do you deal with those issues or just money? Well, they start out with money because everybody's got a money issue. So right. <laughs> that's, the, that's just the starting point. And I make it very clear that it's never about money. Okay. So if it's not about money, what is it about? So when you said relationships, when you're having a problem with a relationship, that's generating emotions. That's yeah. generating feelings. What are you feeling? When have you felt it before? What would you rather be feeling? And right. do you know how to feel that? I had to teach myself how to feel touched and how to feel loved. Those were feelings that I, I knew about, but I hadn't truly experienced. And so I had to find out way, find ways and develop them for myself as to how to feel those feelings. And how did you discover that? Like, where did you look? Did you read a book? Did you ask no. people? Who, <laughs> no. How did you I remember, figure that out? Well, first of all, remember I started doing this work in the early 1970s, there weren't a whole lot of books right, right, <laughs> about right. this stuff. So um, at one point, I actually gave everything I owned away and went wandering for a couple of years, just following that inner direction. Wow. So I learned how to listen, really listen to that, you know, and, and 
quite clearly, this was my job, was to learn about feelings. <laughs> you know, coming from Sadkins don't feel yeah. to having more emotional intelligence than 99% right. of the population, this was my job. Right. And so once I learned that I needed to find out what I was feeling, I would, I would go inside, which I'm very good at now. I've been meditating since 1972. Wow. So I would go inside and, and figure out what I was feeling. And even today, I, after all these years of doing this work, I, I keep learning new feelings. When I was working with this abused woman the other day, I realized that, because the way, when I work and people tell me their situation, I say to myself, well, what would I be feeling in this situation? Right. Because it's pretty much the same for all of us, you know, so yeah. it's close. Yeah. So I realized after talking to her that I had thought I had dealt with the abuse, the emotional abuse issues. Yeah. But I saw that there was a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, because I make a decision that I'm going to figure something out, and so I went inside to try to remember how I felt when my father would, would get into that space where he was picking on me and, and teasing me and mm -hmm. demeaning me. Mm -hmm. And I could just feel myself contracting. Mm -hmm. And what I realized that I felt was powerless. Mm -hmm. And how many people these days feel powerless? Right. because of the corporate stuff that's going on, because we have no power to really change our immediate situation. Right. And when you're in debt, what's one of the main feelings you feel? Right. It's powerless. Right. Okay, so, so this is how I learn it, is I go inside and, and figure out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, so let's say you do feel powerless. How do you get out of that feeling? Nobody wants to live feeling powerless. Okay, so this is one that I've been working on because I, yes. as I said, I had to go deeper into the abuse issue. And so I cre I, one of my, my superheroes is Wonder Woman. So I, I decided to let the Wonder Woman inside of me come out Okay. And at the same time, I became very aware of the waif, this poor little girl who had no power. I mean, I could see the two different characters inside of me. Right. And so then I started having Wonder Woman <laughs> interact with the waif, <laughs> you know, and, right. and to have the, the waif understand that she was protected but also to ask myself, how would I behave as Wonder Woman? Right. In other words, would I stand taller? Would I have more confidence? You know, so, and I had been working on the confidence thing all along. So it's a process. I mean, here I am, it started in the early 70s. Here I am this many years later, and I'm still working on it. And it's when people say to me, well, when would this be over? <laughs> when you die. That's right. That's right. So, so enjoy the process. Yeah. So I'm really interested in a whole bunch of other things. How has this, like, life's work affected your relationships? Well, first of all, I had very few social skills. Although it was really funny because I was really popular in school. Because basically, I was... I was a born leader, so I would take control. In right. other words, I would, I would get my power through external means. Right. So, but I, so like, and I'm a, I'm a knowledge junkie, I'll admit it. I, I just need to learn something new every day. Yeah. And at one point I realized that I was aggressive and learn, needed to learn how to have a different approach, how to be, um, what's the word they use? It starts with an A too. Um, anyhow, so I read books on how to do that. I right. read books on body language. In other words, my goal was to understand nonverbal communication. Assertive. So I, assertive, that's the word I want, yes. Right. <laughs> my 79-year-old brain gets a little 
quirk Got sometimes. It. Sometimes it. it takes me 10 minutes to, to remember the answer. And um, so it, it's a matter of self-awareness. Now, I evidently have more than most people. Right. It, it's just that's part of who I am. And so I say, okay, how can I use that to help other people? So you have to, I had to be service oriented to keep wanting to do this. And I, I get my kicks from helping people, right. but I have to be careful because not everybody wants to be helped. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? And I want to change gears in one moment, but before we do, what do you do with your brothers who, who are not comfortable feeling? What do you do with people like that? I love them. Okay. And... <laughs> And don't expect them to accept what I'm saying or to change the way they are. So I, I want to just share with you something interesting. My experience of you is this, and I was on your podcast not that long ago, but my experience of you is like, I just want to spend more time with you. I just want to like get into your brain and get into your world and understand what the heck are you saying? How are you saying it? How do you work with people? Like I want to sit in that little corner of your room and just watch you for a while. That's the feeling I have as I am interacting with you. Uh, one more question though. I want to switch gears. You said you're 79 years old. Right. Okay. So clearly you have this youthfulness about you. <laughs> uh, what is your secret? What is your like, like health plan? How did you like, look at you? You look like you're in terrific shape. Yes. Well, I walk a mile and a half a day. Okay. And, and now, I, and I want to just say underneath it, I have a connective tissue disorder called uh, Ehlers-Danlos, Ehlers-Danlos, which is genetic. Yeah. So I don't make enough collagen. Okay. And it's the kind of thing that causes all sorts of problems. Yeah. Fortunately, I didn't find out till I was 65. So I had to figure out how to change all the things that were bothering me. Okay. Well, the first thing I did in 1973 when the doctor said to me, I wouldn't be depressed anymore if I stopped eating sugar, I stopped eating sugar and have wow. not eaten sugar since. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like nothing sweet at all? Well, fruit. Okay. And, but I, I limit how much fruit I eat. It's not like I gross out on, on watermelon, you know, which is a, has a lot of um, sugar in it. So I... In 1972, I think it was, a doctor said to me I could never be healthy, that I was just a hypochondriac, and I should learn to live with all my disorders, of which okay. there were many. Yes. And so I thought to myself, uh, that's not my story. I've got to find a way out of this. There right. was one health food store in L.A. at the time, yeah. and I got this book called Back to Eden which was all about this natural way of living. And so I've been on an alternative path for a long time. Now, I've had to have a number of surgeries because of this thing, I had, I had my hands fixed and my feet fixed and my stomach fixed. And so I, I don't I push away uh, uh, allopathic medicine completely. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a partnership. And I don't believe the doctors. You know, if they tell me something, I say why. Right. And I want to know if they really know what they're talking about. When I was 10, I remember uh, saying to my father, I don't think the doctor knows what he's talking about. And my father said, well, he's the doctor, you know. Well, I, <laughs> I learned that that was not the best path for me. Right. That I had, so I started reading books on physiology and microbiology, and then I got into all the alternative stuff, and and so, uh, you know, you ask, how do I stay young? Well, I didn't get old, <laughs> you know. It's like <laughs> I decided to be healthy. I remembered for doing hours worth of of uh, affirmations. I'm perfectly healthy and can eat whatever I want. I'm perfectly healthy and can eat whatever I want. I would do that for hours every day because I was so disabled when it came to my physical body. And did that work? Oh, look at me. <laughs> well, can you eat whatever you want? Yeah, well, actually, I was pretty uh, food sensitive and smell sensitive. And about 
five years ago or four years ago, I think it was, there was a doctor in town in Santa Fe who does this thing called no, low dose allergen immunotherapy. <clears throat> and I knew about it for a long time. I just knew he did allergy stuff. But I finally went to see him and he does this thing that only 200 other doctors do. And I had to go for uh, this little, no testing or anything. You just go for an injection. First it's once every two months, then every three months. And I'm up to now a year and a half and I can eat whatever I want. But not and, sugar. And smells don't bother me anymore. But not <clears throat> when, sugar. Well, I choose not to do that because I don't want to have inflammation. Right. <laughs> sugar. And, and, you know, people are very into dopamine fasting now. They want to not, <clears throat> they want to regulate their pleasure molecule. It's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> it's like, if I've learned to be very disciplined by not eating sugar in this world for 40 some odd years, I have amazing discipline. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I, one question, like all of this conversation leads me to going somewhere totally different. If someone is suffering from a loss, let's say they lost a family member or something like that, do you think your methodology could help? It does on some level if the person is willing to learn how to feel the grief. The reason why people stay in grief so long is because they're afraid of the grief. It is, it, it really is, it really hurts. And some people feel it more than others. I sometimes say that I, I'm missing the grief gene. You know, it's like, I really believe that this is not the end, that the, I don't know what's next, but I, I feel like if nothing else, when, when we die, we just go back into the energy soup, you know, <laughs> and, and, and we go on that way. But it's like, you have to feel the feelings. And I found that when my father died, I had a harder time getting over his death than my mother's because I had such a good relationship with her when she died. So that I really had to get over the, the feelings that came from my relationship with my father that the grief wasn't necessarily because he was gone, but because we hadn't really worked out what was going on. Mm -hmm. And it took me a number of years to work mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, I think that people want the feeling to go away right away. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the shame that you, you're, you come into the world with doesn't go away. Nothing goes away quickly. So people take a pill, take drugs, whatever they have to do in order to make the pain go away. But I've learned that if you can make the sound of the pain and let yourself feel the pain, it's interesting because I had a lot of physical pain. And, and, I, and I, I didn't want to take a lot of drugs and things um, other than what I was taking to get high, but that was a, a different section of my life. <laughs> Not and that section. You're not in that section anymore. No, I don't do not any drugs. Once in a while. No, I have no desire for it. <laughs> it's really amazing. So, so I learned that. And and when you say, "How do you learn it?" it, it the ideas just come to me. So I'd have this awful feeling, particularly in in my in my digestive system, and I would make the sound of the feeling, and the pain would go away. And it was like, oh. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to try that. <laughs> yeah. And, but, and, and so now, I mean, I, I use magnets and there's an acupressure pad because I have scoliosis and all sorts of physical things because mm -hmm. of this connective tissue mm -hmm. disorder. So I get more of a chance than most people to, to figure out how to make it feel better. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so changing gears one more time, how do you work with people? Do people sign up for a period of time? Is it, Hey, I'll just talk to Joan once. Like how, how does it work? Well, if people, people who are attracted to what I do usually hear me on a podcast or one of my podcasts and they say, I know you get it. Yeah. That's, that's what they say to me. I know you get it. Right. Okay. So um, first of all, I have them fill out a, 
a personal snapshot so I get an idea. Yeah. And then, and I like them to commit to a minimum of three months. Six months is even better. And, and it's different for every person, although I'm developing patterns like, you know, what did your mother do? What did your father do? How many siblings did you have? And where were you in the birth order? And every person has such a different story that I, I, I have to, you know, and so I work with people very intuitively. And there's another thing I do that um, I, I haven't talked about much, although I used to do groups with this where I do an energy adjustment, um, commonly known as a zap. And <laughs> I can like do, that. Can you do this virtually? I do, yes, oh. I do. Um, and I've, I've done, I, I have a group, an intention plus action coaching group. And at, about once a month, I do a zap for the group. And it takes people into a, an altered state. And we do like altered states. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no drugs. And uh, so we go into an altered state. And I use sounds. I can feel the the energy of the group, and I make sounds to make the release. And and I I do whatever I hear to do when I'm okay. doing it. So so just give me a bit of a logistics. If you were to take on a one on one client, it's what a call once a week. It's twice a sense? month. Twice, twice a month. month. Twice a month with the emails in between, so that they don't feel disconnected and they can ask me questions. And and people kind of need the two weeks to process what we do because okay. I, I I tend to you know it's like I'm not real good at small talk <laughs> like Gosh. to get to the heart of the matter right away Got and it. so um because I, I I have developed this seeing um I can see what's going on and the people have to you know and I give them things to do and that sort of thing okay. and then I find out two weeks later did you do it or not? And right. I'm not a critical parent, so whatever they do is fine. Right. And my job is to love them and teach them how to love themselves. Where, where can people find you? At prosperityplace.com. Prosperityplace.com. Joan, you're a delight. I love spending time with you. I just want to spend more time with you, to be completely <laughs> honest. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I really... It's not that I learned intellectually something new, but I feel like I learned something more profound in this conversation that causes me to walk away and, and think about things slightly differently. So I appreciate that. Thank you for spending this time with me. And thank you for appreciating me. I really love that. I do. I really do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.